In this video, I want to take a look at two different uh, critical lenses for critical analysis uh, in the same video here because they are connected but different. So we're going to take a look in this video at feminist and gender studies criticism. Uh, so feminism and feminist critical theory and gender studies critical theory, really two separate schools, but, uh, but closely connected enough that I think we can talk about them uh, combined in this video. So first of all, let's take a look at feminist criticism. Feminist criticism examines articles using a framework that considers the ways in which an artifact reinforces or undermines the economic, political, social, and psychological oppression of women. So again, we're taking a look at things here through the lens of essentially women and how women are represented in whatever artifact we're looking at, whether that's literature, whether it's other types of media, movies, um, art, any, anything at all, really, uh, even, even through the, the, the news or any other uh, publication like that. Um, we're looking at how women are represented and, and uh, how traditionally uh, feminine or uh, you know, values would be represented and, and characterized there in all of across the across the spectrum here again economically politically socially psychologically just how are women represented and portrayed in these works in comparison in particular to men so the history here of uh, sort of the history of feminism uh, and just you know, this is going to be just so surface level but uh, but just to give us a little bit of background uh, feminism is typically divided into what they call three waves and the first wave really uh, runs from the late 1700s into the early 1900s so here we're talking about just general attention being drawn to the the inequality of the sexes and how the sexes are treated how they're represented um, in the united states in particular now this has been happening worldwide but in the united states in particular the the Probably the the uh, the biggest representation of this came in the early 1900s with the uh, suffrage women's suffrage movement, and uh, and so uh, you know things like trying to uh, earn the right to vote for women and and just you know being treated as as equals in that sense um, started for us here in the United States. Well, it started a long time ago, but really represented well in, with the women's suffrage movement in the early 1900s. But the first wave of feminism, again, starting in the late 1700s, really just was about seeking equality and equality of treatment in general uh, for the sexes. Um, and the second wave then it sort of runs from, you know, unofficially from the early 1960s to the late 1970s. So that 20 or so year period there um, where you, you have this post-World War II world where in World War II women really demonstrated that they could work right alongside men and and you know and did pick up a lot of the slack for men that were were fighting overseas so women filled those roles in the factories and in in the workplaces and different things like that so so really had an, an opportunity to demonstrate um, that they were equally as, as capable and qualified as men to do really anything and so and then this sort of in this period coincided of course with the civil rights movement in the united states so coinciding with the civil rights movement for um for uh, for people of color and and you know minorities in, in that sense you also had the equal rights amendment for women and things like that that were um uh, being pushed and so you have this sort of second wave of feminism so to speak sorry i forgot to scroll forward here but you have the second wave of feminism running from again the early 1960s through the late 1970s where again searching for um recognition of equal rights but also um equal opportunity in terms of not just employment equal opportunity to for things like you know abortion would be representative of this the idea of control of of their own body being able to make decisions about their own body being able to make decisions about whether or not they would work and and if they were going to work should they be you know treated equally and things like that that was their their goal in, in that sense still in the in the late early 60s through the late 70s in that second wave of feminism then finally, you have the third wave, which which would be what we're presently in. It started in the early 1990s, really it's recognized there, and runs through the present time. Um, this third wave, um, and really the the biggest difference in the third wave between the others is the emphasis on what we would call marginalized women or marginalized people in general, but marginalized women. So again, women of color, or women of lower economic classes. So, you know, in the initial first wave and second wave, really the predominant focus was on middle and upper class white women. Those are the people that were, you know, we were, we were basically saying these people should have equal rights. And, and now in this third wave, we're, 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 there's, there's a statement that, you know, it's not just middle and upper class white women who have, you know, should have these equal rights and be seen as equals. It's, it's all women 
women of all colors, women of all economic classes um, deserve this, this freedom and this recognition. And, and so there's this third wave now starting in the early 1990s through um, present day. Okay. So, and, and the history of feminism is important because it's really also the history of feminist criticism. Right? So it follows along those, the same types of lines. As long as you've had feminism at work, you've had this feminist um, criticism at work, people viewing things through the lens of these particular um, feminist um, and, and uh, yeah, the, the viewpoints of feminism and, and these particular uh, feminist frameworks. So some of the major premises of, of the feminist criticism are, first of all, women are oppressed by the patriarchy. That's, that's kind of their cool, their core uh, mantras that women have been oppressed by the patriarchy, the patriarchy being this male dominated, male controlled, uh, culture and society that we've had for, you know, thousands of years now that, that men have really been on top and men have really been seen as the dominant, uh, dominant sex and, and had more opportunities and, and, uh, greater opportunities than women have had, uh, so that the, and, and have that men have then really systematically as a result, systematically displaced women and, and, uh, and undervalued women and treated them unequally so that women have been oppressed by the patriarchy. Uh, we also, as part of the, one of the premises see that Western culture is deeply rooted in this patriarch patriarchal ideology, uh, perhaps more so than other cultures um, where there is uh, more imbalance probably in Western cultures than there are in other cultures in terms of some other cultures, not all, but some other cultures as far as uh, how women are treated and whether or not they're seen as equals and where their value lies, um, that the Western culture is deeply rooted in that sort of patriarchy that uh, while sex, meaning male or female, is determined by biology, that gender, masculine or feminine, is determined by culture, and that different cultures identify what is you know, kind of masculine and what is feminine, as opposed to uh, biological determinants determining what is male and female. We have this, you know, differing ideas about masculine and feminine that are entirely based on culture. And that whether we're consciously aware of the gender issues, that they play a part in every aspect of human production and experience, including the production and experience of literature and other artifacts. So the things that we might be examining here in terms of artifacts, um, that, that, that culture, those gender issues um, play a part in that. Um, just because they're, they're sort of, a uh, have become sort of our innate human viewpoint, uh, based on how deeply they're rooted in our culture and that they're then exhibited through as a, as a natural byproduct in the types of art that we produce and the types of literature that we produce and, and also how the uh, respective sexes are represented in those works. So some common questions that you see in, um, feminist uh, criticism um, some of these will not surprise you uh, how, how is the relationship between men and women portrayed so how does this piece or this artifact whatever it is this book this piece of music this whatever how does it uh, indicate or what what kind of relationship does it indicate that men and women have how does it portray that relationship what are the power relationships between men and women um, or are they, or are characters assuming male, female roles? Are they assuming those traditional roles? But, and if so, what are the, the power relationships like who's in charge here? Who has the, uh, the who has the, clearly has the power in this particular relationship relationship? And how is that represented in that work? How are male and female roles defined? You know, again, is this a fairly traditional, um, breakdown of, of, uh, male versus female attributes and, and uh, responsibilities and roles and things, or is this a little more uh, contemporary where you have some more androgynous portrayals, you know, uh, males just uh, representing feminist ideals and, and vice versa, female uh, representing uh, male ideals and things like that. What constitutes masculinity and femininity in this, in this work? And how do the characters embody these traits? Okay. So, um, how does this work seem to define masculine versus feminine? And then how do the characters embody those traits? What, what is it that they do or don't do or say, or don't say that, that uh, gives the idea that they embody those traditional or non-traditional roles. Do characters take on traits from opposite genders? How so? And how does this change others reactions to them? Right. So are, do we have men, uh, again, acting in an androgynous way or acting in a feminine way where you have men portraying feminist traits, 
or fem, you know, feminine traits and, and females portraying uh, masculine traits? And if so, how so? And if so, how does that change the way people react to them? Or, or is, it, is it considered commonplace or is it considered out of place for people to do that? Um, so how do people respond to them doing so? What does the work reveal about the operations again, economically, politically, socially, psychologically of patriarchy? So what does this tell us about how patriarchy is, is maintained and how it's established in a, in a particular culture? All those types of things about the operations of those things. What does the history of the work's reception by the public and by the critics tell us about the operation of the patriarchy? So, you know, again, how do people's responses to this? Um, what does that tell us about the patriarchy? And then finally, what role does the, the work play in terms of women's artistic history and artistic tradition? Uh, so looking back, what does this uh, particular piece tell us about um, that particular uh, artistry or tradition? Okay, shifting gears here just for a second. Uh, let's take a look at gender studies criticism. Uh, again, very closely related, but but uh, different from feminism here. We have gender studies criticism. Gender studies criticism examines artifacts using a framework that considers roles and issues of sexuality, power, and marginalized populations in an artifact. Okay, so again, we're not just looking exclusively at, at the dichotomy between men and women. Now we're looking at uh, all aspects of sexuality, power, and marginalized populations in an artifact. So in kind of a brief history of gender studies, um, it really is an offshoot of feminist criticism. It started kind of within that framework of feminist criticism. We started looking at, you know, again, how women were represented in, and how this patriarchy was represented in, uh, in artifacts and in literature and uh, all different kinds of, uh, of media. And so then uh, as an offshoot of that, people started thinking, well, you know, this is really kind of too binary, too binary. Uh, and so they, they focused started uh, gender, gender studies really started focusing on what, what they call the in-betweens, the in-betweens. So it's, it's again, a less binary approach than feminist criticism, which is very much masculine, feminine. That's it. Let's look at those two things. Let's look at the dichotomy between how feminists, how, how women are represented in these works as opposed to men. Whereas gender studies says, let's look at all the elements. Look, let's look at all the in-betweens, not just this binary um, men and women thing, but what about all the in-betweens? What about the in-between sexualities? What about the in-between uh, power structures? What about the things that aren't just about men versus women, but still related somehow to gender? Um, so let's take a look at those types of things. So it's, it's an offshoot of criticism uh, of feminist criticism, but but it focuses more on those in-between areas and, and actually takes on a broader scope um, as opposed to a very narrow scope of feminist, which is, you know, again, men or women, men versus women or, um, you know, women versus the patriarchy or whatever you want to call it. Um, but uh, gender studies it broadens that, that spectrum and looks at a variety of different factors there. So the major premises of, of uh, gender studies criticism uh, are that, uh, that a binary view of artifacts is too narrow. Um, that, that it's just not, it's just not broad enough. Um, and that, um, there's more to this than just masculine versus feminine. And that the, uh, the other issue is that the definition of those concepts of, of masculine and feminine and so forth, uh, and any kind of term along those lines is constantly changing within a culture. Uh, which also then defies attempts at binary classification. So when we look at, you know, if we look at, uh, feminism. Again, we've talked about there, there are three different waves to feminism. They're all different, but we just look at the idea of what is, what do we consider masculine and feminine these days, as opposed to, you know, 50 years ago, 50 years ago, let's say, well, let's just say to, to, in the 1950s, our idea of feminism uh, and what it meant to be feminine is different than what our idea of feminine is today. Right. The, the, the idea of, uh, the, you know, the prospect of, in the 1950s, if you'd said that, uh, that a woman wearing, um, uh, jeans and, uh, you know, things like that would have been appropriate and would have been considered, you know, sexual or sexy or whatever, or, you know, would have been considered feminine still if a woman was wearing pants. Uh, even in the 1950s, that would have been, you know, absurd. Women don't wear pants, right? So our idea of feminist, what, or feminism, what it means to be feminine has changed over the years and, and is constantly changing. 
And so are ideas about everything else. They're all culturally bound. And as we know, our culture evolves and changes over time. So, um, so our definition of these things changes over time. So it's, you know, gender studies says it's not just as simple as masculine versus feminine, because those things aren't even stable. Those things aren't even static. They're changing all the time. Those, those notions of what it is to be masculine or feminine. Right. So, um, so how can our study of those things remain the same, be static? So gender studies both allows for looking at those in-betweens, but also broadens the scope into saying, okay, we let's adapt and, and go with the times here and, and look at things uh, in a different light. So those are the major premises of cultural uh, gender studies, sorry, gender studies in criticism. A couple of common questions that you have in, in gender studies, when you're looking at these types of things, first of all, what, uh, what, if, what sort of support, if any, is given to the elements and characters who question the masculine feminine binary and what happens to those elements or those characters? So what do you, what happens when a character doesn't fit neatly into, you know, the traditionally masculine or traditionally feminine uh, viewpoint and, uh, and how is that character treated in the, in the artifact and, uh, and what happens to those characters and those elements as a result? What elements in the text exist in the middle between the perceived masculine and feminine binary? In other words, uh, what elements exhibit traits of both? Okay. So where do we see androgynous behavior between character or within a character where they're exhibiting both masculine and feminine, uh, or, or maybe those, you know, just some other non-binary uh, connection uh, between whatever it is that people are, are working at there. What does the word or what does the work rather contribute to knowledge of queer, gay, or lesbian experience and history, including artistic history. Okay. So again, looking at those kind of marginalized populations, what does this work contribute to our knowledge of, of that culture and, uh, and of that, of that population, uh, including their artistic history and the, and the way that the, their artistic history history relates to the artifact that we're looking at. And how does the artifact illustrate the problematics of, of sexuality and sexual identity? You know, what approach does it take on that? Or does it avoid it completely? Yeah, that, that, which would be very telling in and of itself. So you have some common questions that we oftentimes associate with gender studies criticism. So, so as an example here, just real quickly, I just wanted to go through, you know, kind of a, a well-known piece of literature or film or however you want to look at it. It's, it's both. It, it was literature first and then it was uh, film and uh, has branched into every other kind of media, I think as well. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's an interesting one because it's very, very popular. Many people have, have, uh, have experienced this and are fans of, of this, uh, series. And so I wanted to take a look at it in terms of feminism and feminist theory, um, because it's a very well-known, um, work here. So we're going to take a look at the Harry Potter series, just in, again, not any one particular book or movie or whatever, just in general, Harry Potter as a world and that, that was created there, there by J.K. Rowling. And, and uh, so again, just scratching the surface here, just, just to give you an idea of what some of these look like in application. So if we look at some common questions from feminist criticism and relate them to the Harry Potter world, how is the relationship between men and women portrayed? I think there's, you know, there's a lot of interesting uh, connections between men and women. You, you have um, women in some ways that are in positions of power, like Professor McGonagall, but not in the ultimate sense of power, right? And then when there is a woman in the ultimate sense of power over Hogwarts, for example, it's the evil woman, right, who takes over after Dumbledore and uh, in place of Dumbledore and is is very cruel and uh, and just so it's interesting that when when a woman does finally get in a position of power over Hogwarts that she has to be the the uh, cruel headmaster and uh, and you know the one that everybody hates. Um, it's also interesting the relationship between men and women when you look at the, at the main characters between Harry and Ron and and Hermione. Um, uh, I think that, uh, Hermione, Hermione is, uh, it receives some interesting character work. Um, she's portrayed as, as really probably the smartest of, of the people there and the most accomplished, most, most capable, and yet not the main character. That's interesting that, uh, she's not the main character in some ways is, 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 uh, is consigned to that kind of second tier, uh, and her power only comes through really when it's in combination with Harry and or Ron. Um, but, uh, but you know, there's, there at least is a, is a significant bond or relationship between the three of them, including both men and women. What are the power relationships between men and women or characters assuming the male female roles? I think uh, that obviously the, 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 the it's, a, this is sort of a traditional, even though it was written by women, it's sort of a traditional, 
uh, men in power type of, of uh, uh, work here that, uh, the, again, Hermione really isn't the focus of this book, but, uh, or of this series. Um, she's not the, the title character, of course, but she's also not the main character. She works really in conjunction with other people and never really, uh, on her own, um, for that, for that matter. So, um, so there, there are some power relationships here that where men tend to be in the powerful and controlling roles. How are the male and female roles defined? Um, somewhat traditionally, I mean, even in the in, in the instance of the Weasleys, for example, Ron's parents, um, his dad is the one who goes to work. The mom stays at home uh, for the most part and uh, and does homebody type stuff, home, stay at home mom type stuff, which is not a knock on stay at home moms, but uh, but not very progressive in that sense. Right. That we don't see a lot of women. We don't have a lot of strong examples of women who are who are leading the charge there. And so the, the roles are fairly traditionally defined in these in these books and, and movies. What constitutes masculinity and femininity uh, and how do characters embody these traits? Um, so um, it's interesting. A lot of times there are fairly standard displays of masculinity and femininity, um, especially when you look like Ron and uh, you know Hermione or Ginny or people like that, the women in these roles that, uh, that have a fairly traditional uh, masculine and feminine relationships. Harry is somewhat androgynous. He's a little bit more sensitive and uh, would, would be characterized as having a few more feminine traits, I think, than, than the others, but uh, um, but really not so much. There are a few cases of women who are portrayed with highly masculine traits. Again, for the most part, these are women who are in the quote-unquote evil roles, right? You have, uh, you have uh, um, Bellat Bellatrix Lestrange is a very strong woman, but very masculinely strong in those senses, uh, or, or has a lot of masculine traits in that sense. Um, uh, the, the new headmaster whose name escapes me, I can't uh, remember, um, Umbridge, I think her name, but, uh, anyway, uh, very masculine oriented, very, you know, powerful, very, very strong in terms of uh, her power, but, uh, but, uh, does not wield it in a very feminine sense, if you will. The characters take on traits from opposite genders. How so? Does this change others' reactions to them? As I said, Harry does a little bit. He's a little bit more sensitive, a little more empathetic, and, and gets some flack for it, right? He gets called a lot of names, and people tend to think he's weak as a result of that. So um, so he does a little bit, but but not in a, it's not necessarily portrayed in a positive way. What does his work reveal about the operations, uh, economically, politically, socially, or psychologically, of patriarchy? What well, we see the men in charge of pretty much everything for the most part and the men making all the decisions men uh, men kind of running the show so it does kind of um, reveal itself in that way somewhat i think um, how, what does the history of the work's reception by the public and the critics tell us about the operation of patriarchy well it's very popular obviously one of the most popular book series in the world uh, in in the history uh, of the world one of the most popular movie franchises and highest grossing movie franchise franchises so there's a, a a lot of positive reception by the public that they must not mind so much that that this is primarily male driven and uh, and really the women have at best subordinate roles what does the history of the work's reception by the public and by the critics tell us about that? Oh, that's what we just looked at. Isn't it? So let's take a look at what role does the work play in terms of the women's artistic history and artistic tradition. You know, that's a tough one. I, I don't really know. Um, it could, because it's, it is sort of falls into that patriarch patriarchal framework where it's, it is fairly traditional despite having a couple of strong female, you know, characters, those characters really have more male, attributes in terms of personality so it really kind of falls into that old uh, old, old system of, of supporting that kind of patriarchy and um, patriarchal system or, or ideological system anyway oh yeah so next time we're, we're looking at something we can think about it through this lens as well this feminist uh, and gender studies theory and just try to consider it from as always from a variety of different viewpoints and, and standpoints if you have any questions about this, feel free to email me. I'd be happy to respond to any emails that you might have. Um, so uh, don't hesitate to do that. But in the meantime, I hope you'll consider next time we're looking at, a, at, a, at an artifact or a piece of literature or whatever, you consider the uh, the kind of feminist implications or general gender studies implications of that work as well. <laughs>